Hello, everyone. I'd like to first thank you all for tuning in. And thank you very much to Adele Nazdowski for inviting me here this afternoon. My name is Tom Sabo, and I'm a board-certified behavior analyst, completing my doctorate in psychology at the University of Nevada, Reno. My mentors at UNR are Larry Williams and Stephen C. Hayes. Before I begin, I want to point out uh, to all the BCBAs out there that there are many other professionals and potentially parents who are tuning in. So I'm going to keep the technical jargon down to a minimum. I'm going to introduce a few terms and put them in the context of Skinner's radical behaviorism. Um, but I'm, I'm not going to speak scientist to scientist technical terms throughout the discussion. This is an introduction to everyone. This is a really nice time of year. It's not too hot out yet, and it's delightful to get out onto the deck and to cook. One of my favorite things to do is to grill up some salmon. This was my salmon from last night. It's looking pretty good, right? Hot off the grill, what I do with my salmon is I chop up a fresh lemon to squeeze it over the salmon. Wow, I think I missed my calling. You're gonna have to call me the galloping gourmet from now on. So now what I'm gonna ask you to do is to join me in imagining that we're cutting this lemon in half. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this juicy lemon and we're gonna take a huge bite out of it and slurp down its juices. Yuck. So what happened? The word lemon was in a particular type of relationship with grilled salmon. It has several functions for us if we use it in that context. It's flavorful and tangy. It has a bright aroma. And you really want it on the table to enhance the flavors of meats, veggies, and dressings. But we changed all that by imagining what it would taste like to bite into it raw. We transform the function of the word. Now that function is one of yuck. And just hearing me speak about it, damned if your lips are not puckering up, you might have winced or startled. But with all those reactions, what's interesting is that there is no lemon in front of you. So how is it that talking about lemons could produce those responses? Now, you might say, gee, Tom, you know, all I have to do is say, want to eat? to my dog, and even though there's no food in the room, he starts twirling in circles and salivating. And you'd be right to point that out. But let's take it a step further and look at the question that Alfred North Whitehead posed uh, on the right-hand side of your screen to B.F. Skinner on the left side of your screen. Skinner had just published The Behavior of Organisms and was making waves with his discovery of operant learning. Whitehead asked Skinner to provide a behavioral count of an utterance, no black scorpion is falling upon this table. Skinner did, but it took him 20 years, 23 years to do it. And his reply was the book, Verbal Behavior. The question turned out to be a really truly complex one. Can radical behaviorism explain the enormous generativity of our language repertoires? Well, it's worth noting that verbal behavior was the very first attempt in history to provide a thoroughly functional account of language. The central premise is that verbal behavior can be broken down into several functional units that function, that as a whole, can be conceptualized as behavior that's reinforced by a listener that is specially trained to provide such reinforcement. Now, this explanation was quite radical for its time, and it had enormous utility in teaching people with disabilities the basic verbal operants or classes of behavior. Humans learn in infancy to ask for things that aren't present, to speak in a particular way in the presence of an object or an event, and to echo the behavior of other speakers. But the analysis becomes much more complicated as Skinner tried conceptualizing, fantasizing, dreaming, self-editing, and thinking. Relational frame theorists and other theorists working within the behavior analytic tradition have offered mild criticisms and refinements. From the RFT perspective, there are both conceptual and empirical issues with the approach. 
First, there's nothing else we do in behavior analysis that considers the behavior of one organism only with respect to the behavioral history of another. And that's requisite within this account. For verbal behavior to occur, a listener must mediate reinforcement and must be specially trained to do so. That's from page 225 of verbal behavior for the geeks out there. Second, there's an inherent problem with this definition because any organism in an operant chamber that learns pulling a lever is going to result in food is training the organism outside of the box to present that food. But what if the food is presented by a non-living mechanism? Is the speaker's behavior then not verbal? How has the response changed? Now, one final problem from an RFT lens is that comprehension of what the speaker says could be rightly justified as a response to, but that's not considered verbal behavior under Skinner's definition. These comprehending responses are what Linda Hayes would call subtle, unapparent, but observable under certain conditions and worthy of a behavioral analysis. Now, an empirical problem worth noting is that very few studies have been conducted on these more complex forms of behavior using only Skinner's foundation. In other words, it has not led to a robust research base that's helping people to live more effectively. And that was always the goal. But let me give you a, a quick example of the difficulties. A few weeks ago, I was in Los Angeles and my friend Doug, uh, with my friend Doug, and we ate at a restaurant. Getting up to exit, I noticed Doug was about to leave his bag behind. And so I said to him, hey, Doug, I imagine you're not planning to leave behind that really nice black. And Doug finished off the sentence, but my bag. Now, using Skinner's technical terms, and let me first apologize to the non-behavior analysts in the group. What was my utterance? Was it a man for him to pick up his bag? A disguised man? Or was my behavior under the control of a discriminative stimulus and therefore attacked? Was it an introverbal in that it required a very specific response, the word ag? An autoclitic? A descriptive autoclitic? What, what was it? An, a descriptive autoclitic? I said it was a really nice bag. Or a qualifying autoclitic? I said, I imagine, right? So was my utterance an introverbal man tact? or a descriptive, qualifying, autoclitical tact disguised as a manned interverbal? You get the point, right? It's cool to have these functional units, except they're not so functional. I don't know how teaching them is going gonna, is gonna to improve my kid's sense of irony, the capacity to dream big dreams, interpret ambiguous text, or respond flexibly to novel situations after having developed a very rigidly stated rule. So at the time that these conceptual problems of verbal behavior were being explored, some very useful research was being conducted on rule governance. Take, for example, Hayes, Brownstein, Zettel, Rosenfarb, and Korn, 1986. Subjects in two groups were seated in front of two alternately lit lamps and told to press either one of two buttons to earn points exchangeable for cash. They could press a button as many times and as fast as they wanted. Sometimes, when the red light was on, pressing the red button earned fast points. And sometimes, when the white light was on, fast presses on the other button earned points. One group was told, press the red button fast when the red light is on. The other group was given no instruction. What neither group was told is that the lights had nothing to do with the schedule of reinforcement. In other words, the lights didn't signal a change in the contingencies related to pressing either of the buttons. As it turned out, the group given no instructions earned a lot more points than the group told to press red when the red light was on. The group given instructions held on to those instructions like they were from God really, really tightly held. So the implication is that although rules can speed learning, keep us from contacting unwanted con consequences, we can become insensitive to direct contingencies when our behavior comes under the control of rules.
so it's kind of a bit like the old psychology experiment. Um, you, you, you put a, a rat in one corner of a maze and you put cheese in the other corner of the maze. And the rat starts sniffing around and he starts moving around. Eventually, he finds his way to the cheese. And if you're like me, you're a really nasty opera and psychologist. And you pick him up and you put him back in the corner that he started again. And he does this again. He gets lost along the way, but eventually finds his way to the cheese. By the third time, you put him in one corner. He gets pretty good at this and he finds his way directly to the cheese. Now, again, if you're like me, you're a really nasty opera and psychologist. And I put him back at the beginning of the maze again, except this time I move the cheese somewhere else. He goes back to where it was before. He twirls around in a circle. He scratches himself. And then he starts exploring again. He finds the cheese. You put him back in the first, in the corner again, and he finds his way to the cheese. Now, you do this. I put you in one corner and teach you to find the cheese in the other corner, and then I switch it, what do you do? You start banging away at the corner. You start lifting things. You start blaming people. You start saying it's not fair. You start coming up with new rules about why it's supposed to be this way and it's not that way. That's what we do. Slide, please. So at the same time that research on rule governance was progressing, Sidman developed a strategy for teaching reading that made use of mathematical set theory. That's where the terms reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity in Sidman's equivalence come from. For those who haven't been trained uh, on this, the illustration shows two pictures of a hat. The training begins by testing for reflexivity. In the presence of a hat, can the learner pick out an identical hat? This is called reflexivity. Um, which is the requisite for identity matching. But if you then teach the physical hat is the same as the spoken word hat, which is illustrated in the bottom left corner of your screen, a verbal learner is found to be able to respond such that when someone says hat, he will look at or point to the physical hat. The blue arrows in this diagram are what's taught and the red arrows are learned without direct teaching. That's called symmetry, a sort of bidirectional equality. So next you teach the learner that the printed word H-A-T, the bottom right hand corner of the illustration, is the same as the physical hat. And once again, the learner is observed to respond with symmetry, such that when presented with the written word hat, uh, he looks at or points to the physical hat. What's really cool about this phenomenon is that without any further instruction, the learner begins to respond to a relationship of equivalence between the spoken word and the written text. This is called transitivity. Thus, four relations are learned after teaching only two. Now think about it. That's a pretty economical way to teach. So since this groundbreaking research began, a number of groups within behavior analysis have attempted to develop a theory of how stimulus equivalence comes about. These include Horn and Lowe's naming hypothesis, McIlvain and Dubé's stimulus topography coherence, and relational frame theory. The RFT approach is simple, really. We're essentially saying that language and cognition are relational responding that's learned through multiple exemplar training and comes under the control of contextual cues that specify either the type of relation or the function of the relation. And this type of relational response can be arbitrarily applied. Now that's a mouthful and what it means is really important. The things that get related don't have to be ever, ever, ever related before. You can pick up any two things or events, and if you're verbally able, you can show how they're the same, how one is the grandfather of another, how one is superior to the other, how they're both members of a class of even bigger things, etc. In other words, the things that get related by those who are verbally competent can be completely physically dissimilar and don't have to exist in time and space. In other words, the functions of one stimulus alters or transforms the functions of another stimulus in accordance with the derived relation between the two without additional training. Now, that's still an awful lot to digest, so I'm going to unpack that a bit further in the next 10 minutes. <laughs> 
This transformation of stimulus function thing is so important that I'd say it's at the heart of the analysis. Before I explain, let me point out that there are two general contexts that we speak about. One is a non-arbitrary context. That's when stimuli of interest are topographically or physically related, like a big tree versus a small tree. Second, we talk about arbitrary contexts. These involve verbal stimuli that have no physical relationship to each other. So I can compare a toothpick to the moon or to the ampersand symbol on my keyboard. That's totally arbitrary. So when we talk about transformation of stimulus function, in its most elemental and non-arbitrary form, there's nothing new here. We see it in responding conditioning. An unconditional stimulus produces an unconditional response. But when a neutral stimulus is correlated repeatedly with an unconditional stimulus, that produces a response, the formerly neutral stimulus becomes correlated with the same response. The functions of both stimulus and response are transformed. And so we now call them conditional stimulus and conditional response. It's the same thing in operant learning. After a response is reliably produced a consequence, the response becomes an operant and the consequence either a reinforcer or a punisher. The functions of behavior and consequence have been transformed. Now, what we call derived relational responding in a non-arbitrary context is done by all living organisms. So in the non-arbitrary context of smaller than, an organism learns to approach the larger of two food resources and to recede from the larger of two aversive stimuli. I really like this bear myself, but I probably won't approach even the smallest of the three bears on your screen myself. In an arbitrary context, things are a little different. We can train a verbally able child that a physically smaller dime is larger than a physically larger nickel. The child will then, when asked which is smaller, respond that the nickel is smaller. The important point here is that once several of these larger, smaller relations in an arbitrary context are learned, the functional context of worth or value is learned also. So once I learn that a nickel will buy me a gumball, I derive that a dime will buy me something even better, like five minutes on a video game. And a quarter will buy me a chance to win on a slot machine. And here's where it gets really interesting because, and, and this is why I say that transformation of stimulus function was, was never observed or anticipated by Sidman. Because there's a chance I'll bring in the bacon on the slots, just seeing the quarter can evoke smelling the leather upholstery of my brand new car that I bought with my earnings, feeling the baby smooth red paint on the exterior of my brand new slot machine one Ferrari. That's transformation of function. So remember our equivalence drawing, right? Well, this is the point in this talk where even the behavior geeks get a bit cross-eyed, so I'm going to try and go real slow. Feel free to send me a note if I'm going too fast. First of all, uh, note that in the RFT view, reflexivity is a given. But a new term is introduced called entailment. It's a clunky term, and maybe it should be replaced with something less cumbersome. Um, but we're not using the terms reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity for a reason. The terms reflexivity, symmetry, and transitivity connote point-to-point -point correspondence in equivalence relations. But equivalence relations are only one type of relation that can be imagined. Take, for example, the following scenario. In 2007, uh, Dewar, Hamilton, Fink, and Harrington did this study where undergrads were trained to establish arbitrary relational functions for three abstract visual stimuli. So in my illustration, I'm showing you A, B, and C, but what they're responding to were figures that had no actual meaning, like wingdings in your office products font list. They're arbitrary stimuli. In the presence of a, B, and C samples, participants were trained to select the smallest, middle, and largest 
of a series of comparison arrays, respectively. The B stimulus was then used to train a steady rate of keyboard pressing for the A, which is the smaller, and the C, which I should choose the largest, stimuli were presented. Participants pressed slower to A and faster to C. They had derived that C is more than B and B is more than A. And these untrained relations we call entailed. That is, they are a necessary consequence of the training that A is less than B and B is less than C. In fact, they're mutually entailed, which means that the relationship Whatever type of relationship you're examining, and in this exam example, we're talking about a comparative frame of relations, there's an arrow going in one direction and an arrow going in the opposite direction. The participants also derived more and less relations between the A and C buttons. Note that this is all very similar to equivalence so far. But instead of using the mathematical term for transitive equivalence relations, we use the term combinatorial entailment. This means that the AC relations, just like the untrained relations between AB and BC, are the necessary consequence of the two trained relations. But here we're observing the combined effects of the two trained relations, and there may or may not be relations of equivalence, hence combinatorial entailment. Now here's where Dewar's experiment gets interesting. At this point, B was paired with a mild shock in a Pavlovian procedure with skin conductance change as the dependent variable. In other words, we're measuring sweat. When presented with A and C, six of the eight experimental participants showed smaller skin conductance to changes uh, to A and larger skin conductance changes to C than to B. We call this transformation of stimulus function. In the equivalence in RFT literatures, transfer of function tends to be used when untrained function acquisition is based on stimulus equivalence, and the trained and resulting untrained functions are the same. Transformation of stimulus function, on the other hand, tends to be used when untrained function acquisition is based on stimulus relations other than equivalence such as the comparative frames of more or less in this example. I think it's also important to note that uh, multiple exemplar training was used to establish the samples as relational cues in the Dower 2007 experiment. So simply put, framing is putting relations between stimuli into different classes or frames. There are several that have been identified thus far, and I apologize for the busyness of this slide. Frames of coordination are equivalence frames. Thus, equivalence is the phenomena that is explained by RFT as a theory, as coordinative relational framing. Framing in terms of coordination and in terms of distinction or differences both appear to be necessary repertoires for a learner to have in order to be able to frame in terms of opposition, hierarchy, causality, and temporality. The most challenging repertoire and the one that could be the focus of a lot of important work to come in the autism community involves dectic framing. A dyectic is a word that specifies identity spatial or temporal location from one particular perspective. Dyectic framing involves speaking from a locus of self, a perspective that's situated in time and space, but flexible enough to evaluate what something looks like or would look like from a different perspective, that is, a different time-space person. What's common to all of these ways of framing events relationally is that they mostly don't need to be trained in typically developing children, and they occur at an exponential rate. Let me give you an example. Let's say I buy a new car, and I enjoy driving it, but I move from Reno to a big city where I'm just constantly stuck in traffic. I begin to frame driving in coordination with getting stuck in traffic. Walking really gets me to and from my various meetings just as fast and with less hassle. So walking for me is now in a frame of opposition to being in a, in a traffic. And 
being in my car. And because walking is healthy, I begin framing it equivalently with going for hikes on my favorite trails. And I begin to frame driving, which I still might enjoy, as something that has lesser value to me than being healthy. And that's when I begin to be regularly mindful, so to speak, of the probability that if I keep driving all the time instead of walking or taking my bike, then I'm likely to become obese, a causal frame. So you can see how rapidly this all happens and not necessarily in that particular order. It's quite useful, really. It's obviously a repertoire that has conferred our species with evolutionary advantages. But there's a dark side to framing relationally, and that's the stuff of another webinar on acceptance, commitment, and resilience. I'm going to shift gears now, um, and I'm going to talk about how this can be applied with kids with autism and other related disorders. Before I start, though, let me point out that Ray Felt and Barnes Holmes have edited an excellent book on RFT applications for learners with autism and developmental disabilities. Additionally, there's the new RFT book edited by Diamond and Roach, uh, and that has several chapters of interest to this community. But I want to highlight a study that's worth checking out. It's a small, tightly designed study that came out of CARD. Angela Persicki and colleagues in the Autism Research Group and uh, I need to pull up a slide, so give me a moment. So their study was called Establishing Metaphorical Reason in Children with Autism. And uh, uh, they point out that kids with autism have tremendous difficulty with non-literal language. Um, the language of the schoolyard is just filled with sarcasm and irony and uh, metaphor. And uh, all of these types of, of, of speaking involve complex uh, verbal behavior, relations of coordination, hierarchy, and distinction. Um, slide, please. Uh, we're up to the establishing metaphor slide, Emily. I might not have told you to switch before. Metaphors are everywhere in our verbal communities. They're a very efficient shorthand for describing things that are less familiar to other people. And you can imagine how devastating it must be to a kid who doesn't acquire this repertoire. He's not able to follow his teachers who use sarcasm. He's not able to play effectively with his brothers and sisters or explain things effectively to other people. Slide. What Persicki and, and colleagues did was they evaluated three component skills for learning a metaphor or understanding a metaphor. The first is to relate the target, uh, the thing that's being related to its properties. Let me give you an example. I'm going to say that John is the salt of the earth, okay? And picture John. He's tall, he's buck tooth, and he helps people see the good things in life. That's why you you know, it's salt. Salt. We're saying he's salt of the earth. Salt is granular. It's a mineral. And it brings out the good taste in food. So what Persicki did was they uh, they said the first thing that the learner has to do to kind of see what John as the salt of the earth really means is they first have to relate the target or the thing that's being related to its properties. Uh, so John is the target, and he's tall, he's buck and he helps people see the good things in life. And uh, the next thing is, is have to relate the vehicle or the metaphor to its properties. And the metaphor here or the vehicle here is salt. It's granular, it's a mineral, and it brings out the good taste in food. And the third skill that the learner has to acquire is relating the properties of the target to the properties of the vehicle and to select the properties of the two that are most similar that are related in the frame of coordination. So John is tall, salt is granular, they're not particularly related. John is bucktoothed and salt is a mineral, uh, well, they're not related. John helps people see things, the good things in life, and salt brings out the good taste in food, good and good. Those are related. They're in a frame of coordination with each other. Now I understand John is salt of the earth. Slide, please. <laughs> 
So the way they illustrated it, and I apologize for the fuzziness of this picture, is uh, they told children a story and then asked a question about the metaphor. And uh, I'm having trouble reading this myself. The question reads, uh, I once knew, a, the story was, I once knew a boy who always wore yellow. He liked to stay up at night and was really strong. And if I said he's a superhero, what would I mean by that? On the left-hand side of the diagram, you see the target is this boy, is he, and you can see that he's in a hierarchical relationship with all of his properties. He wears yellow, he stays up late, and he's strong. On the right-hand side of the illustration, you see the vehicle, or superhero. And a superhero has several properties, too, that the learner has to recognize, like wearing capes, flying, and being strong all of which are in a hierarchical relation with the vehicle or being a superhero. Now the learner has to compare each of these three relations. Well, wearing yellow and wearing a cape, they're not particularly related. They're in a frame of distinction with each other. They're separate. Staying up late and flying, they're also in a relation of distinction. In other words, they're not related. And strong and strong, well, they're in a relation of coordination or equivalence. That's what the learner has to recognize to understand he's a superhero. Slide, please. Now, RFD posits that metaphorical reasoning, like any other behavior, should be teachable via multiple exemplar training. And what Persicki and colleagues did was they used multiple exemplar training to train metaphor comprehension and they measured the percentage of correct responses to untrained metaphors in a multiple baseline across participants study. Now, they added something in. So kids who didn't respond to the correct stimulus discriminations during multiple exemplar training were given additional assistance in the form of visual aids. And then they checked for generalization using probes uh, consisting of novel stories and post-training with stories in a baseline assessment followed by the training phases. Slide, please. And these are their data. Notice that for three participants, we have Sheldon, Howard, and Raj. Uh, during baseline, uh, illustrated with closed black squares, neither of the three kids were able to answer comprehension questions correctly. During multiple exemplar training, there were two phases uh, training stories with training questions that had prompting sequences illustrated by the um, closed back triangles and uh, uh, probes uh, using novel stories were illustrated by the open white squares. And as you can see, Sheldon didn't get very far with that in the probes and uh, neither did Howard. Raj, on the other hand, with just multiple exemplar training, was able to meet the performance criteria specified and moved on to post-training. For Howard and for Sheldon, the second step, multiple exemplar training plus visual aids, were used to bring their performance up to criterion. And as you can see, that worked just fine. Post-training probes and uh, uh, generalization probes showed that the learning maintained, at least for a brief while. I guess the important thing about this current finding uh, this, this is that general fiction to untrained metaphor uh, um, could be taught using multiple exemplar training. Um, now I'm gonna do a little case study here of my own. I'm gonna talk with you a little bit about um, training perspective taking and empathetic behavior. and. Um, uh, this is a client of mine who I'm going to call John, who is a 24-year-old man with a mild intellectual disability, and his problem behavior that he engaged in was some pretty, pretty nasty teasing of his less able roommates. Um, he also refused refused to help around the house, engaged in you know, uh, this kind of tension maintained shock behavior. What he would say really quite punishable by law, but pretty um, Now, the what is more than um, and he'd like to have friends, and he'd like to shock people, but he doesn't know how to make them or keep them once he gets them. 
just like this. So, uh, I reviewed the social skills training literature and found that it's pretty weak. Uh, it's weak for a variety of different reasons, uh, largely because uh, a lot of social skills training takes place in a vacuum and there's not enough exposure. John, on the other hand, was getting lots and lots of exposure. Uh, so he didn't need any more exposure. Uh, and I started looking at the perspective taking literature. And uh, from an RFT perspective, perspective taking involves what I was referring to earlier as didactic framing. The framing of I and you, he and there, and then relations in all kinds of combinations. Um, now, up until this point, we've been using differential reinforcement and replacement behavior training for John. We've gotten a uh, fair bit of results, but this last little bit of problem behavior was just getting in of his successfully transitioning out of having me as his behavior analyst. So we added in a perspective taking training as an add-on to the existing protocol. And the question was, could we teach the discrimination of emotions with a focus on perspective taking relations using direct instruction and precision teaching? And our corollary question was, would this acquisition target have an effect on John's problem behavior? So at baseline, uh, we conduct one. John is three emotions: happy, sad, mad. During 20-second timings, he could say three to five words when asked to talk about his dad, his roommate, his caregiver, or himself. He engaged in three particularly nasty teasings of his peers, uh, and two of the shocking behaviors that I. Uh, talked about that actually resulted in him getting suspended from work and increased restrictions uh, at home. So we had two targets. One was a skill acquisition goal, learning to use 10 new emotion words in relation to himself, his father, his roommate, and his caregiver after he would spend an hour either by himself or with any one of these other people. And a second target, which was the outcome goal, uh, reduction of the problem behavior and an increase in cooperative. Slices. Our intervention involved two one hour sessions. We used direct instruction to train the contextual features of 10 novel emotion words, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate that in a few minutes. And the materials that we used were flashcards with images of people displaying various emotions in particular contexts. Multiple exemplar training to teach di didactic relations with respect to emotions of self and others, and precision teaching methods to increase and to measure fluency. Lastly, we used a uh, didactics text that was developed by Louise McHugh and colleagues in 19, uh, 2004 uh, to weekly test for the attainment of what we call simple reverse and double reverse relational frames. I'm not going to go into that because it's not the focus of this talk per se right now, but this is a way of evaluating whether the repertoire of the perspective taking that we call the framing has been acquired. Slide. So these three images are examples of some of the uh, hard flash. So, for example, if you take a look at uh, the girl on our side of the screen, um, she is not like this. So this girl is surprised. You tell her her eyes are wide open, her mouth is wide open. How can you tell she's surprised? Very good. What is it about her eyes? X. What is it about her mouth? No, her mouth is wide open. That's how you can tell she's really surprised. That's an example of uh, so I might say something like, what if you were her and she was you? How would you be feeling? How would she be feeling? I might have to tack in something about if you were there and she was you and you were her and she was you, how would she be feeling? How would you be feeling? So this is how we train the deck to relation. 
All right, so the next slide, please. Um, these are some of the examples, the multiple exemplars that we use for training embarrassed. And uh, as you can see here, the relative contextual cue is smiling and uh, uh, putting your hand over your face. And if you go to the next slide, you can see that the relative contextual cues for being ashamed are somewhat similar in that hands are covering the face, but you can tell that neither of these two people are smiling. Next slide, please. And you can make out that these two people are proud, and we teach using the same thing, discrete trial, uh, um, direct instruction. And uh, not only direct instruction, but we do this in 20-second uh, uh, precision teaching timing. So we have a stack of cards, and uh, we're asking the person to, uh, after we've taught them, then what we do is we do this, uh, these timings to see how many of these they've learned. And so we flip through the cards very rapidly and see how many of these they can name correctly. And then we track their number of corrects and their number of incorrects. Slide, please. Here's a slide that shows feeling unwanted, and uh, um, we had several more of these slides that tapped into some uh, more teasing-related and uh, um, problem behavior-related emotions that would show up for people. And uh, our expectation was that if we were successful, we would see a decrease in that kind of teasing behavior as John began to be able to take on the perspective of his roommates who were experiencing these kinds of emotions. Slide, please. And here you can see uh, the clinical outcomes. First of all, John acquired the 10 words that we had set up for him to learn. He started to use them in novel contexts at home. And it got kind of cool because I took him for walks downtown and uh, pointed people out to him and asked him on the basis of contextual cues, what does he think that this person might be experiencing? And he was able to correctly identify contextual features to back up the inferences he was making about other people's emotions. Probably the most important thing here was that his problem behavior dropped off to record lows and stayed that way for well over six months, such that when his annual meeting came up, he'd met the criterion for terminating a restrictive behavior plan. And uh, when somebody asked him how he feels, he said he felt proud. This was cool. His caregiver was in tears. His mother was really, really, really moved. And uh, uh, I don't know if he's had any problem behavior since then, but yeah, I don't believe he's been suspended from work, and I don't believe the police have called ever since then. So, this is a successful, um, this is a successful strategy. Uh, next slide is not data from John, but. I thought I would show these data because this program that I developed uh, was modified from a program that Donnie Newsom had developed. Um, and Donnie and I were working together on a grant, and we were teaching caregivers to use uh, differential reinforcement and uh, replacement behavior training. And in the data slide that's in front of you now, you can see that uh, just like with John, uh, this particular client that, uh, that Donnie was working with had shown some progress with differential reinforcement and replacement behavior training. But once we teched in didactic training, uh, didactic framing training, then what we saw was very, very good. We saw um, not only an increase in the desired behavior, but a decrease in the problem behavior as well. Next slide, please. So the take-home point is that focus on didactic framing. I think it's very, very important towards the development of perspective taking and towards the ultimate goal, which is the development of empathy. And by the way, I forgot to mention about John. He also started being more cooperative around the house, cooking, helping with, uh, with bringing in the groceries. Uh, some really cool behavior started to emerge. So I think that this is a very promising emerging area of interest in the field. Not a whole lot of research has been done. I know Donnie and Kendra at Fit Learning are looking to publish some data soon. Uh, I don't have any data to publish. I'm uh, looking at other things to do in research. But I think that this is very promising. So in summary, next slide, please. Skinner's verbal behavior was a very, very important part of our behavioral history. It was the first attempt at explaining generative language use. Um, but many have felt that there were some refinements that were necessary, and uh, 
uh, among those that have been offered relation, relational frame theory is one. We call it an extension of Skinner's model that further explains the ways that learning can occur, can occur in the absence of explicit instruction. And it provides a thorough integrated account of complex human behavior, including problem solving, metaphor, rule following, persistence in the absence of reinforcement, rigid repertoires after repeated training attempts, and flexible repertoires after brief exposures with multiple exemplar training. Slide. I would say that some very important next steps are, uh, even though we have over 100 basic laboratory studies, we are really at our infancy in applying this in clinical contexts and in educational contexts. We need to start applying this in real world settings and training, for example, caregivers in how to effectively and efficiently use the basic frames in order to build up important repertoires in our learners. As I said, I think it's really important that we focus on didactic framing and perspective in order to build perspective taking and empathy skills. And I think that we might also do well to focus on teaching creativity and focus on accelerated learning using things like precision teaching and direct instruction in order to augment the work that we're doing in relational frame theory. Okay, everybody, thank you very much. I guess that's it for now. Um, and once again, thank you to Adele for having me come out and join you guys. Bye-bye.